obviously you know the theme of this show. It's right in the title, Marketing Together. As you've heard me say before, if you've been a subscriber of this show, that we go further faster when we're marketing together. But one thing that may not be as clear, marketing together with who? Who are we talking about? Or is it marketing together with whom? Anyway, you get my gist. Well, in this episode, we're going to go beyond talking about marketing with agency partners, complementary brands, and integration partners, and we're going to zoom in on marketing with creators. Nick Bennett, who recently joined Airmeet, talks in this episode about three distinct paths to marketing together with creators. Influencer marketing 2.0, we unpack what we mean by that. Creating a creator studio, something that the team at Airmeet is pioneering in a new way. And bringing creators in-house, we talk about how brands like Lavender are supplementing or adding to their marketing team by bringing content creators in the fold of their brand. I think you're going to take some new ideas on marketing together with creators from this conversation with Nick. So let's jump right in. As you and I have talked, it's kind of this overlap as we talk about marketing together, who are the people at play? It's really brands, creators, but then also other creators. And I kind of have this Venn diagram. How would you kind of explain what's even going on right now in this area? Yeah. I mean, I I think that companies are starting to realize, especially in B2B, that that people are a driving force behind the content that they create. However, they have to be empowered to be able to do that. And I think what we're seeing more and more of is people buy from people. We all understand that. And I've seen firsthand the impact that content creation can actually make for a business's bottom line. I mean, previously at my last company, Alice, I drove $2 million in pipeline over a two-year window, 60% of that closed. Now, that's really a zero cost outside of my time, really, but I consider it as part of my role. So what happens when you amplify that with the other people that are within your company and also externally as well? And when you have people that are kind of, you know, I don't want to say household names, but people that you see all the time on LinkedIn, on TikTok, on Instagram, all these places, you start to you start to think of them in a different way. You start to get to know them more. And I like to 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 use like MTV Cribs, like uh, the amazing show. And everyone always wanted to know like what these celebrities' houses looked like. Like what was their personal life? What kind of cars did they drive? What was in their fridge? Um, and I feel like now in B two B in like the creator economy, that's another thing. Like people create content, but there's still the personal element that connects it all. And that's what people are really starting to to dive into. Yeah, absolutely. And as we think about this, I've heard you kind of explain this. It ties into, I I just presented a session on why you need to be a content creator, specifically as a partner leader uh, at Partner Ecosystem Kickoff uh, here uh, earlier this week. And I kind of had some reservations. I was like, am I really a content creator? How many followers do I need to have to actually be a content creator. So as we start to talk about how do brands work with content creators and how do those creators market with other creators, let's take a step back. Like, how do you define content creator and how does that play into your own journey uh, at, in your current role and as a content creator? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think everyone is a content creator at heart. Like everyone has lessons or learnings that they can share. I mean, technically as soon as you hit post or send or whatever, you've created content. Like you are a content creator. I think the difference is like people associate content creator with like influencer. Now I think, and we can get into that as well. I think there's obviously a difference there and there is different levels and tiers and things like that. But I mean, everyone is technically a content creator. It's more so, are you spending the time to actually put your thoughts out there? Are you diving into the consistency aspect? Are you diving into wanting to show up every single day, whatever that means to you, whether that means creating content, engaging in the community, like LinkedIn, like the comments section. If you could find 10 to 15 other like-minded people that you want to be like or want to follow, and you just add to the conversation, you'd be surprised at how quick relationships are built. And I feel like relationships are built on everything right now. Like again, going back to people buy from people, relationships drive a lot of buying behaviors in B2B right now. Yeah. And you bring up a really good point. I recently put together a course for our our sales team and how they could leverage being a content creator. I think to your point, it's, 
if you are, if you're learning and you're sharing that, whether that's LinkedIn or any other format, right? A content creator doesn't mean video. It doesn't mean you're a podcast host. You could just be typing out your own text posts on, on LinkedIn. And, and like you said, hitting post. I think we're going to get into this a little bit as we talk about these three different paths. Um, but you've shared before, you see this inversion happening in the way that brands are working with creators, putting the content first versus putting the creator first. And I think in these three ways we're going to talk about, it plays into each of those. But what do you mean by that? What's, what's kind of the, the way that it has been done? And the, how does that compare to this inversion you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's we've always as a brand said, OK, great, we want to work with specific people and we would go tell them which content to create. We kind of capped their creativity to a certain degree because we're telling them exactly what to do. We're giving them guardrails. There isn't much freedom beyond what we're telling them because we have a specific SOW that we're looking to achieve X out of. And so we're going to go find the people that can help us achieve that. Now, the way that I think is a better way to think about it is putting the creator first. So many people are passionate about creating things. Why not have, say, five, 10, whatever the number is, people that you want to create with and collaborate with, but have them come to you and say, hey, I really want to work on this project, or this is the reason that I want to be part of this creator economy. I want to collaborate with other people. And you'd be surprised. A lot of people have different reasons that they want to create content. Um, and a lot of people are, are, you know, experts at creating certain types of content, whether that's video. Yeah. And so I think it's, I think it's all about the fact that we have to change our mindset and put the creator first. And if we embrace the creator and kind of become an engine that empowers creators, you learn more about their audience, which you probably already know. You help them kind of pick the right topics. You help them produce content that is relevant and personal. Ultimately, again, being the person that people will want to work with and the way that you can benefit from it is through a variety of reasons, but they're going to be like, you know, Hey, how did you know? I've, I've never seen this content before. It looks really well produced. Who did it? Cool. Okay. Now I know who to go check out for this. Um, so I think it's just switching the mindset and putting the creator before the content. The content is still important. Absolutely. But you don't want to limit someone's, um, creative freedom. Creators can help brands get, see further down the line. They can see further into the community. They can see further around the bend because of the way that they're interacting with, um, uh, with the community. Would you say that's true? What are, what are the things maybe you would add to that? Or maybe you've seen in your own journey of kind of relaying stuff from the audience, from the community that you're creating content for as a creator back to the brand. Yeah. I mean, when, when you're, when you're out there and you're creating content and you're engaging with people and you are where your buyers are, think about how relevant and important that information would be to the brand. Like it's, it's, and it has to be a two way street as well. It's like, you know, information it's, I always thought of about when I was a field marketer, it's like you have information that was coming from HQ to the field. I would relay that to the sales team. Sales team would relay it to me. I'd go back to HQ two way street, but everything that I was seeing as a field marketer in region, in specific territories was so important to relay back to corporate that was say in the West coast that had no clue how Boston, for example, operated or how they bought and I think it's the same way with the creator aspect of it. It's like, if you can see what's coming, what are important topics to people? What are people struggling with right now? It's, it's hard to know what's coming unless you have people to relay that information to you. You mentioned something earlier, Nick, about what motivates creators. And it can be different. It can be monetary. It can be an exposure. There can be a passion for a certain type of content creation that they just want to lean into. How would you encourage brands to think about that? What's kind of risen to the top as you start to talk to creators? What's kind of on their list of potential motivators and how brands can kind of have that list, have those conversations and start to think about how they work with them. I think we're going to talk about these three different methods, but before you do that, you got to start with the motivation and align the conversation around that. Then you start to work out the mechanics, right? 
Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And so I've kind of, I put this out there to, to 15 or so people that I trust their, their opinions. And the number one thing that actually most of them have come back with so far was the opportunity to collaborate with other creators. And, and maybe it's because they don't have those relationships. Maybe it's because they just don't have those opportunities or the resources to do those types of things. And I think that's why the the intersection between creators and community and like collaboration is so interesting to me because even myself, like I, I love collaborating with people. If someone says, hey, you want to go do like a TikTok skit with me? Absolutely. Because I don't usually have those opportunities. Like it's it's fun to collaborate with people where you see their content every single day. And that's the number one thing that people have told me so far. They want one access to the, to the the other creators to be able to brainstorm with, workshop, different types of things, but ultimately collaborate on projects, whether that's through video, whatever. Like it's just it's something that seems to be most important to people. And I think finding a way to bring people together, ultimately, you know virtually at first, but down the road in person, think about how impactful that can be. It can be you're building real relationships with people and your people that you usually see their content online. And now you're in person creating content together. You're building these awesome relationships. You're traveling together. You're doing all these cool things. It, it becomes a lot bigger than just a piece of content. Yeah. And I think it changes the relationship as well. And I think it, it's a good segue into talking about these three different models. I mean, you and Mark and the, the team at Airmeet are, are likely going to refine this, uh, this framework, this, you know, ways of, of working with creators. But as you and I have been talking, we've kind of talked about, you know, who's, who's doing this well, who's trying this, how did these ways differ a little bit? But I think before you get into those, you've I mean, you laid out something good there. If you're thinking about working with creators, oftentimes you might think, okay, what's their reach? What are we going to have to pay for that? Uh, what's going to motivate them? It's just going to be dollars. Um, you may be jumping to that conversation too early, right? Because if people are creators, then they're naturally creative. And so they enjoy that collaborative process with other creators. So you might be able to add value outside of the what can we pay you to, you know, uh, to rep the brand or create this content uh, with us? There, there might be some some leverage there that that you can um, you can use as the brand because you have the ability to connect them with other creators if you just go about it the right way. So let's get into these these three ways we were talking about. Um, I think the first one is uh, kind of a version two of typical influencer marketing. Uh, the second route is, um, similar to what you guys are trying to pioneer at Airmeet, And that is a different sort of relationship between, uh, brands and creators that differs from your typical influencer marketing, even in newer ways. And I think a lot of that has to do with the relationship and the comp structure. And then the third is to bring creators in house. So let's talk about that first one, kind of influencer marketing 2.0, who comes to mind here? What does that sort of look like? Yeah. I mean, I think Cognizant is, is a good example of this because I've been seeing a lot about this lately. I mean, Morgan Ingram now has kind of like an SDR series with them. And it was funny because I was watching the clip the other day and it had the Cognizant logo up in the top right corner. So they're the ones that are probably producing it on behalf of, of Morgan but he gets to do something that he's passionate about. He loves talking about the SDRs, the sales process, but he also loves influencer marketing and community. So it kind of like blends both pieces together. And so like he's technically a creator for them. And I feel like it's somewhat of an influencer marketing play and they have other people that they're working with. And I think they do a fantastic job with that. I think it's really, really smart. And I think that's definitely like the influencer marketing 2.0. I think the 1.0 was what, a lot of us are familiar with where we say, all right, cool, we have to go promote this piece of content or drive registration to this event. Let's go find five people with big audiences, pay them for a LinkedIn post or a video or whatever, give them a UTM link, and then basically off off we go. It's a, it's a one and done. Most time, it's they're not focused on the long-term relationship. Um, but I think, the, I think it's an in, interesting kind of... Um, 2.0 model. And I think they're doing really, really well. And I think that more companies are going to start to explore this at first because it's not, 
it's not incredibly hard. And like, guys, I don't know much about their program. I'm actually trying to learn more because I think it's really fascinating, but I think they've done a fantastic job. And I know Todd's working with them as well, um, kind of on the side. So it's, it's super interesting. Yeah. And I, I think you call out some really, you know, easy things there of how this is different from your previous influencer marketing 1.0. And if we call this influencer marketing 2.0, it's really about that inversion that you talked about earlier, putting the creator first, not the content, right? The old way would be, we have this thing to promote, or we have this content we want to push out. We want to get access to this audience and we're going to negotiate how we can get them to push it out versus, Hey, here's someone who is an influencer. They have the right audience. Let's bring them in and, and collaborate. It ends up working similar because you're distributing the content through that creator and hoping to drive back, you know, whatever your goal is, signups, demos, revenue, pipeline, um, all of those sorts of things. But the difference is in how you approach it. Is it, Hey, we have something here, let's negotiate and you do it. Or are we kind of bringing you a little closer? We're deciding on something and then we're taking it out together. So it's a similar motion in the end, but it starts differently. I think is the main difference. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. 100% with you. And it, it's honestly interesting because I, I didn't know like too many others that are doing this and they've always been like ahead of the curve when it comes to these types of things. So I think it's, I think brands, other brands will start to see what like they're doing and like that's a semi easier thing to, to implement, I think. And I think you could actually get a really serious ROI using it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about the second and third avenues here between brands and creators as they're marketing together. Really, both of these apply to some of the things you guys are, are doing at Ermi. The second one is uh, collaborating with creators that's a little bit different from what we've termed influencer marketing 2.0 in this first example with Morgan J. Ingram and Cognizum. What is, what is this motion? What are some of the things you guys are exploring? How's it similar to what we just talked about and how's it different? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a good, good analogy for this is you think about an art studio where people go to create. So the creators are the artists. People go to an art studio to collaborate, to have a place where they can just go and feel at home where they can create what they're passionate about. Then as you create this art, you're bringing that art to museums, to homes, to offices, to art shows. These are the channels that you would distribute in reality, like social media, email, um, video, whatever. It's You have all these channels that you're distributing this art. And so the creators are the artists ultimately, and you're just giving them a place to collaborate. And I think that's that's the interesting thing. It's more so... You, they're they're the ones that are telling you what they're passionate about or what they want to create because one you'll know who's invested because they've thought about this and two you'll know that you're not just putting them in a box because as marketers we like to put people in boxes but you're giving them the freedom to say okay cool I like this now is there guardrails absolutely like for us like you know you have to have a marketing following I thought about do you have to have a certain number of followers and. I think I think maybe further down the line this could make sense, but or maybe there's tiers. Like tier three gets something, tier two gets something, tier one gets something. It, it all depends. This has not none of this has been built out yet. We're literally at the the very very beginning of even thinking about this. But I think I think it's it's really taking the idea of a creator first and equipping them to be powerful, to feel like they can feel empowered to create something that they want to. Now, how do we benefit from that as a brand? I think it's more so, you know, you've got maybe logo placement, you've got shout outs on social media, which drive self-reported attribution. You've got affiliates, you've got links, which will help with SEO. Um, you've got the ability to really build relationships with key people in your ICP. It's, it's a lot of benefits that maybe doesn't directly deliver a revenue or, or pipeline, but maybe it's a longer tail type of play. Um, and so I'm thinking it of kind of like a crawl, walk, run approach. So in crawl for Q2, I just really want to get this started. I want to see what this looks like and find a group of people that will help actually shape the future of what this could be. Because just because I tell you, Logan, that this is the way it should be, doesn't mean that I'm right. But when you have, say, three to five people collaborating on what this could be, 
opening my mind, opening other minds to what is possible. Again, you're putting the creator first and you're giving them the creative freedom to to think about this in a lot bigger. Now you'll have short term wins, absolutely, but I think it's a it's a much longer term play. Yeah. So the way you guys are thinking about it is find different ways to to compensate creators to bring them into this uh, studio. Um, the analogy being an, an artist studio. I like what you said about that. There's still some guardrails, right? Like if you're a painter and you display your stuff in a studio, you still know where your stuff's going to be, how long it's going to be on display. And like, so it's not just totally free form and, and chaos. Um, so you guys are, are thinking through that. Um, other brands, my mind kind of goes to ways that they could replicate this again, kind of building on maybe influencer marketing 2.0 in that first path would be, Hey, let's say they are building a sub brand around a media property, which we're starting to see more companies do the folks at Sweetfish, the folks at audience plus are advocating for this a lot. And I think it's a strong play, um, that, Hey, if you're building this sub brand that is around your ICP, it's a media property that could be a good opportunity for this play with creators where you say, Hey, come in and, and create content associated with, with this sub brand on a consistent basis. It's not like just a campaign, right? Um, it's something ongoing, but you can kind of step in and step out. It's like, we have this studio here and you can do an exhibit for the next, you know, four weeks, or you can come in and do a big, you know, something or other. Do you think that, that kind of, as you're trying to paint the picture on, uh, we're going painting double analogy there. Um, no pun intended. Like, does that fit with kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's more so like the way that I'm thinking like early on is this is more of like a one time or like one off agreement to see like how this works. And so maybe that agreement is over the next quarter, we agree that you're going to create, I don't know, a couple couple episodes of whatever it is that you want to do, um, or we're going to create a pilot and we're going to see how that goes. Um, ultimately, if it's successful, just like any TV show, it doesn't get canceled. It gets renewed and you go into production further. And I think this is another way to think about it. And so ultimately that turns into a multi-month agreement. And it's a combination of maybe you're paying them in cash, maybe it's equity, maybe it's a referral percentage back to them for close one deals. So they're incentivized. Say your ACV is $25,000. Say they're getting 20% of that for any deal that they refer. I mean, you can make some, some decent money really quick if you have a sizable audience, um, great side hustle money, honestly. Um, now, what happens after this first kind of cohort? I think what happens is you have these creator coaches and you start to build like, I don't want to say professors, but like you have, you have like these coaches that ultimately will still create, but they're coaching all the new people that are coming in. So it's not all just on me. It's like, we, we know the process. We know what the future is. It's just kind of like a mentor ish program. Um, and you're working with people and ultimately this becomes a really well-oiled machine. That's a, a really cool idea there. I, I think the thing that you touched on that's been rolling around in my mind as I hear people say this, the creator economy is coming to B2B, you know, kind of this winter is coming mantra. And wh what does that really mean? And, and why is there an opportunity there? For me, and I mentioned kind of my imposter syndrome with the presentation I did at um, uh, Ecosystem Kickoff was... Uh, am I really a, a creator, right? I see people on YouTube. I'm like, I'm not a Mr. Beast. I'm not, you know, Casey Neistat or someone like that, but like within B2B, I've got a decent following. I've, I've created my rhythm. I know what I do. I don't do funny videos like Todd Klauser or Tim Davidson, but, um, I I've got the things that I know how to create and have seen some traction with. And I think there are people like that, yourself included, who have found an impact there. That impact can actually be very substantial in B2B because you don't need 2 million subscribers to have a significant monetary impact if that content is tied to the right brand with the right offer and those sorts of things. And to me, that's where I think it is. It's, it's people have been leaning into this. They're not ready to make it their full-time day job right? Because, Hey, they, they're professionals, they're growing in their career, they're in sales or marketing or whatever function. Right. And so I think people have been wondering like, what do I do with this? 
right? But you call it out really well. There is a, a unique um, impact that creators can have in B2B because they don't need a massive following. They need the following in, in the right places. Um, and I think what you were saying there kind of leads into the third path that we hear people talking about. I imagine you're probably going to talk a little bit about your own journey as well as maybe um, we've brought up Todd a couple of times, what Lavender is doing as another example in this third way, which is bringing content creators in house. So you've got kind of the first version where you're working with them, the second where there's more ongoing collaboration in this studio model, and then bringing creators in house. Tell us a little bit about where you see this happening, how, how this could play out too. Yeah, I mean, I think Lavender is a fantastic example. I mean, you've got Jen Allen, you've got Todd, like the the way that like they're thinking about their marketing model. I mean, they're making noise. They're, they're getting like, think about how many people are tagging Lavender in posts now. And the funny thing is, I actually promoted Lavender way before they were even like anything like big. Like this was like two and a half, almost three years ago, I was like the first non-Lavender person that like promoted them. And so I've always been close to, to both Wills um, and like been a huge fan of like what they do. And so now that like they're kind of redefining what a marketing team looks like. I mean, Jen is, she has an evangelist background. She worked for Challenger for 18 years. Um, she doesn't, I mean, I, you, I guess you could kind of say it's a little bit of marketing, but she had a sales number. Now she's doing like community growth and it's so interesting. Like they're not focused as much on title. They're focused on these people that are well-known that people like, that people want to build relationships and ultimately that create really strong content. Yeah, they're a fantastic example. And I think, uh, something that, that people are really watching, it reminds me of, when I first got active on LinkedIn and Drift was really blowing up. And a lot of that was around the personal brands of DG and DC at, at that point. And I remember posts where people were saying, you know, Drift is really doing marketing differently. I don't feel like I'm consuming marketing content. I feel like I'm watching a reality show. Right. Um, and that kind of, that changed. I think that changed the way a lot of people do marketing. I think this, this third way, especially not to mention the first two ways of, of working between brands and content creators can kind of change the game in a, in a similar way. Um, one of the questions I have around this, if you're bringing content creators in house, or maybe you're identifying a content creator who's already creating content, um, and driving impact, which is kind of where you found yourself at Alice, right? And also a little bit of what your role I'm assuming is going to be now that you're at Airmeet. How do you think about if you have a content creator in house, um, and maybe they don't sit in marketing, or maybe you have kind of your typical marketing motions sit, sitting uh, uh, next to them. How do you think about integrating those, the, the relationship between your typical demand gen uh, content engine and, and you know, a group or an individual content creator that's in-house? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I, I think it actually works out really, really well. And I'll give you a good, a good example of this. Uh, the event that we did, uh, myself and Mark, we sent out a like kind of like an email and um, my name was was in the, 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 the who is this from. And I had people that normally it would go to spam or they just wouldn't open it. They immediately saw my name and that was one of the reasons that they opened it. And that's the way that I think people in house is actually really important to the way that people you know that, that you market to a certain degree we're tying it into integrated plans we're making sure that hey i know these target accounts i can reach out and it's it's just a part because i've built relationships it's just a part of what i'm doing it's not like my job to go sell these people or to jump on a call however i have the relationship why not i'm already in house everyone wins at that point and I think just having the ability to do different things and, and being a name that people recognize, you will get more success. And we, you know, we put a lot of our emails coming from Mark because he's well known from his days in, in HubSpot and Drift and people know who he is in, in the tech world. And I feel like the conversion rates that we've seen, like when it's emails from him or our CEO, like they go a lot more versus just some random person in marketing, you know? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think there's some low hanging fruit there uh, with just that little tweak, right? I love that you end on such a tactical tip of like the emails that are going out to promote whether your live events or your your podcast episodes or whatever they, they whatever you've got going on. Think about how do you lean into and leverage that content creator that's in house that you have a relationship with or whatever the case might be. Um, and you guys have seen a difference in the reply rates, different in the open rates and the registration. So that's really cool, Nick. For anybody who's not following you, who's not aware of what you guys are doing at Airmeet, what's the best way for them to stay connected with you guys? Yeah, absolutely. Find, you know, find me on LinkedIn, Nick Bennett. Um, there's a lot of us now, apparently, and I get tagged. Or the other Nick Bennett gets tagged in a lot of like the posts for me. Then he just tags me, but it's funny. Um, so find me on LinkedIn, shoot me a DM. And if you want to learn more about Airmeet, just Airmeet.com. Um, check it out. And uh, any way that I can help, just uh, let me know. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate the conversation. It's been good reconnecting with you a little bit. I'm glad we've had the chance to create some content together. And uh, I, I think that's the, the place to end it. If you're listening to this, thank you so much for spending time with me and Nick today. Remember, we go further faster when we're marketing together. 